I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to the boardroom. Noon improved, now with more storage. In this video, I'm going to build some storage cabinets for the shop. I'll also build a computer station and a home for my pocket hole machine as well. Along the way, I'll share a few pro tips as well as a few of my thoughts on shop storage. So buckle up, it's going to get dusty. I called up my local plywood dealer and asked if they had anything they wanted to get rid of. I was told they had nine sheets of 18 millimeter rotary cut poplar ply that someone had backed into with a forklift. Therefore, it could be sold for an attractive price. As it turns out, the damage wasn't too bad. It was only one corner, which I could easily cut around. The real problem was how badly warped it was. Not the end of the world, but it makes cutting and assembly slower and a much bigger headache. After cutting the parts to size, I use a combination of narrow crown staples, glue, and screws to hold the corners together. This is known as the hat trick of cabinet making. As I work my way around stapling the back in place, I'm having to fight the warped plywood. One trick I use for areas that won't be seen is to partially drive a screw into the bowed area, then use a hammer to pry it flush with the back, then staple it in place. Here's a first look at the lower cabinet coming together. This shot gives a pretty good idea of the constant fight when parts are not flat. It's a pain, but on a positive note, as the cabinet comes together, the carcass becomes more rigid and the perpendicular nature of cabinet construction straightens out all the parts. Oh, and this piece will hold up the outside of the computer seating area. The angle is to reduce the chance of me bumping my knee and getting an ouchie. No ouchie! You heard it, the shop of princess said no ouchies. At this point, the cabinet box is pretty much done. I move on to what the cabinet is going to sit on. In this case, I'm going to use leg levelers. And leg levelers are great for very uneven floors, but they're especially great for shop cabinets because you can still sweep or vacuum under the cabinets. I'm adding this layer of ply just to give me a little more height under the cabinet, which will make more sense later in the video. This version has three parts, a base that's screwed in place, the center part, and then the foot, which threads up and down. While this may look like an enormous mistake, it's not. I'll show what this is for later. At this point, I have a general idea of where the cabinet is going to be mounted. I like to start by finding the available studs, besides, of course, the one wearing glasses, and mark them with magnets. The magnets will stick to the nails or screws holding the drywall to the studs. And I like to use these magnets that are countersunk for screws, which are great because they give my fingertip a place to go when I'm scooting the magnet around on the wall. Time for a pro tip. When using leg levelers, don't install them on the wall side of the cabinet. They are nearly impossible to reach. And laying down on my sizable stomach and reaching all the way to the back of the cabinet is no fun. Instead, I install a ledger at the correct height and level. Set the back of the cabinet on this. Now all I need to do is use the front levelers to fine tune. This area, which I have marked carefully, specifically, and deliberately, needs to be removed so I still have access to the outlets. Moving large cabinets is a laborious task. Each job is a little different, but I try to only move one side at a time, and I like to think through the steps needed so I have at least something of a plan before I get started. After wrestling the cabinet onto the ledger, it's a simple task of adjusting the levelers.
With the cabinet nice and level, I used some two inch screws and a tapered countersink to attach the cabinet to the wall. I used the magnets placed on the wall earlier to help me locate where these screws need to go. I think it's a good idea to use a couple of screws at the top and a couple of screws at the bottom of the cabinet. This is a three quarter inch thick piece of MDF that will eventually become the countertop. I put this in place so I can take a real world measurement for the next little cabinet that I'm gonna build. This cabinet will be what my pocket hole machine sits on, and I build it totally separate from the other cabinet because I think it's important to keep things adjustable. Who knows whether I'll want to move or get a different pocket hole machine altogether in the future. This is another style of leg leveler. This one bolts on from the top. If you're asking yourself why am I using different styles, it's because when I build stuff for the shop, I always dig through my old hardware box and I use whatever I have on hand. In this case, I also thought it would be neat to show the two different styles in this video. Also, I only used one leveler on this cabinet. It's a small cabinet and I have a little tab built into the larger cabinet that will carry the other side of this one. That'll make more sense in a few minutes. Also, I only had one more leveler in stock, so I was bound and determined to make it work with what I had. Let's see how long it takes you to figure out what I'm doing here. I will admit, this is a little embarrassing. That's right, I glued two pieces of plywood together to make them wide enough for the cabinet back. I just didn't feel like cutting down another entire sheet for this small back. Next, I cut the hole for the outlets. Also note the left side of the cabinet is being held up by the tab sticking out from the larger cabinet. Finally, note that I cut the hole in the wrong spot. So yeah, not my best day. Probably had that coming when I glued the back together. After screwing the smaller cabinet to the larger cabinet and then to the wall, I glue a couple layers of MDF together to create a stable base for my pocket hole machine. And because I'm a prodigal professional, I add some solid wood edging to clean up the look. For this application, butt joints work great and have the added benefit of being faster and easier to cut. Normally I install the first piece and let it run wild on one end. Then I mark, cut, and install the second piece. Finally, I come back and cut the wild end to length. Anytime I'm fitting a tool to a cabinet, I make sure to leave some wiggle room. And in this case, I come back with a couple of washers to lift the pocket hole machine up so it's flush with the countertop. A lightweight tool like this one really benefits from being bolted down to something. Now let's move on to something totally different. This is a small stand for my computer to sit on. The idea is it gets the computer up and off the counter should I ever need to cut a pocket hole in a large panel. I guess adding a computer to my workshop is an admission that I'm starting to lean towards the idea that the internet and email isn't just a passing fad. In reality, this will allow me to stay in better contact with my customers as well as stay on top of ordering materials and, of course, watching the latest awesome YouTube video. 
I've put the lower cabinets on hold. It's now time to build the uppers. I get going by cutting my warped plywood to size. So in addition to being warped, this plywood also had a few spots that were delaminating. Since this is a shop project, I decided to repair the trouble areas. Over the years, I've seen more and more of this, so having a way to make repairs to plywood can be useful. I've had good luck by squirting some glue in the void, using a thin putty knife to spread the glue around as much as possible, and then clamping for a few minutes. With my freshly repaired plywood at the ready, I assemble the upper cabinets same as the lowers with staples, glue, and screws. I wanted to take a second to mention that I'm using a full 3 quarter inch thickness back. While not needed in normal circumstances, in this case I plan to mount a bunch of heavy stuff to the back of the cabinet, so this is the best way to go. Once up on the cabinet jacks, it's easy to make adjustments until the cabinet is at the correct height off the countertop, as well as level and plumb. To screw the cabinet to the wall, I refer back to the magnets from way back in the beginning of this video. I make no marks, I just eyeball it, as well as use the force to get the screw in the correct spot. For the upper screws, I don't trust the force as my training is not yet complete, so I measure and mark for those. Here's another pro tip when installing a run of upper cabinets, get the first one installed level and plumb and do a very good job. Then when adding another cabinet, clamp and screw it to the first, then screw it to the wall. This will make sure the cabinet fronts are nicely aligned. Okay, the cabinet boxes are done. Now it's time to work on the innards. If this seems like I'm working out of order, I am, but it's for a noble reason. My goal is to stuff at least 138 clamps into half of these upper cabinets. I figure the best way to achieve this goal would be to build the clamp storage first, then figure out the hinge and door situation later. I'm not totally sure this was the best way to do this, but it's what I did. I get started by building a rack for my parallel bar clamps. I'm only storing 24 inch and 36 inch clamps in this cabinet, 12 of each size. I have a few 48 inchers, but I rarely use those, so I'll store them in a different location. The storage nearest the bench is reserved for the items I use most. At this point, I'd also like to mention this is the reason for the 3 quarter inch thick cabinet back. It'll easily carry the weight of all these clamps. I move on to storage for my F-style clamps, which I believe stands for Farrington clamp, but I'm not sure on that one. I was hoping to store 10 of each of three sizes, 12, 24, and 36, but when stacked, they were more than the 12 inches of cabinet depth I had to work with. So I goofed around with layout and I found by alternating direction, I could get them to fit. I sifted through my extensive scrap pile, found a few suitable pieces of plywood, and built these I-beam-like contraptions. I installed them with four screws. I had a few clamps in place to make sure I left enough clearance because it was a pretty tight squeeze. I think this turned out pretty good. At this point, for me, I'm satisfied with the proof of concept that clamps can fit in a cabinet. I'll add some more clamp storage to the other cabinet later in the video. For now, I'll move on to the drawers and doors. For shop cabinets, I don't put a whole lot of effort into my drawer box joinery. In this case, I'm just using glue and brad nails. The front, back, and sides are half inch ply, and the bottom's quarter inch, and it sits in a groove. To ensure the drawer slide is installed parallel to the bottom, I use a marking gauge to give the screw tips a target. And to ensure the slide is installed a consistent depth from the front of the drawer box, I use an auto punch to establish the location of the first screw.
I use a Bloom Universal Drilling Template to pilot holes for the cabinet part of the drawer slide. If you'd like more detail on this process, I have a few other videos on my channel that go into excruciating detail. I'll have a few links below. With the drawers installed and sliding slick as snot, I move on to the drawer fronts. These are MDF cut to size with a quarter inch round over along the front edge. I nail the bottom one in place using the cabinet bottom and side as a reference. Then I use a spacer to locate the next one and nail it in place. This makes for fast work of an otherwise tedious task. I add some screws to lock the drawer fronts in place. On to the door hinges. I use my drilling template and a spacer to locate and drill the pilot holes for the hinge plates. Since these doors are tall, I'm going to add a third hinge in the middle. The first line is the center point of the cabinet. The second is where the bottom edge of my drilling template needs to be. There's a fair amount of adjustment in the hinges, so this doesn't need to be super accurate. Quick song recommendation, Synchronicity 2 by The Police, because that song rocks. And if you don't like that song, well, opinions can be wrong. Nextly, I drill the doors with the three-hole pattern for the hinges. I'm using a CMT drilling jig to accomplish this. For more information, I'll have a link below to another video detailing this gizmo. In short, this is a really neat jig that can be set up to use on a drill press or with a handheld drill. I'm thinking about setting up some dust collection for my drill press. Let's take a quick look at the hinges I'll be using. These are Bloom Inserta hinges. Bloom is the company, and Inserta refers to the way the hinge fits and locks into the three-hole pattern I just drilled. When the lever is flapped down, it causes the two 8mm dowels to expand and locks the hinge to the door, making them easy to install and remove. These hinges also have a soft close feature called Bloom Ocean. I'm not sure I like the name, but the function is great. It's built into the hinge cup and can be turned off and on using this little switch. This is neat because it allows me to tailor how soft the doors close. So for example, on a three hinge door, normally I only have two of the hinges with the soft close feature activated. With the hinges in place, the doors click to the cabinets lickety split. Now it's time to deal with the clamp hinge interference situation. Really not a big deal. For the lower hinge, I just mounted it as low as possible. The center hinge was no problem installed in the normal way. For the top hinge, I lowered it an additional inch and had to cut a notch out of the clamp rack. Time for some more detailing. First, with the glorious success of my first clamp rack, I decided to add a few more. I'll build the same way, but size to fit my various clamps. Quick and easy to make, held in place with a few screws, which makes for easy future adjustment. No, this is not a medieval torture device. This actually holds a critical shop supply, the mighty paper towel. Next up, I add some handles. When selecting handles for a shop project, I think it's important to pick ones that won't catch pockets, sleeves, or tool belts. The rounded edges on these will ensure that's not a problem. We have square-shaped knobs in our kitchen that are like right at the wrong level, and they hook my pockets when I'm working fast in the kitchen cooking oodles and noodles. And while that may be tolerable in the house, I just won't stand for that in my workshop. I was originally going to put a drawer in this little outfeed support for the pocket hole machine. 
after screwing it in place, I kind of like it open. So I think I'll try and find something to store in there, like maybe a bench brush or something. Next, I make a couple F-shaped thingies held together with screws and then held to the cabinet with pocket screws. This is a neat way to have vertical storage as well as shelves within the same cabinet versus just a bunch of adjustable shelves that span the entire width of the cabinet. Remember that cutout in the plywood the leg levelers were mounted to? Here's the reason why. And yeah, that's right, work boots and shorts. Uh, my feet have been bugging me lately, so I thought I'd try a shoe with some more support. Go ahead, make fun of me. I can take it. I add some poly to the countertop because I'm hardcore. Here's a neat trick. This stuff is called soundboard, or sometimes it's called sound barrier board. It's sold at most home improvement stores. Normally it's installed behind drywall to control noise, but it makes a really nice pin board, which I thought would be a good addition to this area since this is going to be a mini business center for me. Lastly, I added a power strip with the idea that I could charge my phone or my camera here. So there it is, some new shop cabinets. I ended up fitting just over 150 clamps, some vertical storage for a few longer jigs, and a computer station. As with any storage project, it's never really done, but I'll call this one done enough for now. Thanks for watching. Till next time.